to build a strong team, like your team has to know that you literally have their back no matter what. And when they feel that, like they'll fight for you as well. And that's going to help your business grow and be successful. Hello, and welcome to the Transform Sales Podcast. I am so delighted today to have Rick Elmore with us. How are you, Rick? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me today. Awesome. Let me tell you guys a bit about Rick. He is a serial entrepreneur, sales and marketing expert, and former college and professional football athlete. As a founder and CEO of Simply Noted, Rick developed a proprietary technology that puts real pen and ink to paper to scale handwritten communication. As a chemist, that just sounds really, really cool to me. Um, so how did you start your career and how did you get to um, the place where you are today? Sure, uh, that's a great question. So my background's in actually athletics. Um, if you see where I'm in today and where I started, it would make no sense because it's just so complete polar opposites. But I think there's a, a lot of little, you know, nuggets to pull from this story for anybody who's, who's paying attention, but, uh, grew up playing sports, never really, you know, felt comfortable in a classroom. I just, I don't know if I always got tested for ADD, but <laughs> I never like was diagnosed. I just, I wanted to move and play sports, um, played every sport growing up, you know, from volleyball, soccer, baseball, football, basketball, but I found a really really good liking to football. I was always a big kid. Um, kind of went through some like childhood trauma. My dad passed away when I was really young. So I was like really mad and angry. So like playing football made sense to me. I can go out there and like, you know, get out my frustration. And, um, but you know, got really, really good at it. Uh, we got a football scholarship to the University of Arizona with my twin brother. I have a twin brother and um, had a good career there. I played for Mike Stoops in the early 2000s, was a three-year starter. Um, back then it was the Pac-10, now it's the Pac-12, but I led the Pac-10 back then in multiple stat categories, um, in sacks and tackles for loss. It's like a quarterback leading for touchdown passes. I mean, it was a really important stat category. So had a good career there. Um, was very fortunate to go and get drafted into the NFL in 2011. So I got to live out my childhood dream um, and play professional sports for three years. But like every athlete, eventually you have to hang up those, those shoulder pads and cleats and get into the real world. And um, really didn't know what I wanted to do. And I think this is what resonates with a lot of people. Um, we're all really searching for our passion, you know, what we want to do. And um, I got into corporate medical device sales. You know, number one, I was looking, I wanted to look for something that was going to cater to, you know, my personality. And I was still hyper competitive, competitive, hyper motivated. Um, and getting into corporate sales was something that kind of fed that. So did that for six years. First year, I was uh, rookie of the year for my like division of like the West side. Um, and then the next five years, I was either top 1% or top 5% or top five sales rep in the company. And, and it wasn't because I was like gifted, like salesperson. I just took everything that I was good at as an athlete and transferred it to, you know, what I was doing then. So all my transferable skills, you know, my passion, desire, perseverance, grit, teamwork, um, get down, da knock down a hundred times, get up 101 times. Like just, there's just no quit, right? Like, I think that's something you develop as a, a competitive athlete. But, um, you know, there was just something I couldn't, there was something there that was missing and there was an itch I could not scratch. I was like, there's something else out there that's more for me. And I think this is what could resonate with people is like, they're doing something, they're not passionate about it. They want to find what they, what they're, um, what they want to do next. So, um, put myself outside my comfort zone. I went back and did my MBA in 2017 I had my ears and eyes open, you know, I was like, I want to start a business, but I have no idea what I want to do. Like, I just knew like I wanted to be an entrepreneur because my parents were s small, like, um, solopreneurs. So it gave them the flexibility. And I knew I wanted to do that because the corporate world was not what I wanted to do. Cause I saw the upper management was either divorced, never home, never saw their families. And that, that was not going to be me. So, um, about a year into my program, and this is kind of where like, you know, you know, it takes time. Anybody listen to this guys, like you have to like turn every stone, leave no stone unturned. I was in a, a marketing class and my professor said, Hey guys, you know, at the end of a three hour lecture, um, you know, what works better, you know, he was going through the success rates of marketing. Everything was super nominal, um, email, uh, direct mail, cold calling, knocking on doors. Everything was like 
4%, 7%, 11%. And then he ends the lecture saying, hey, guys, like, and here's like the light bulb moment. He's like, hey, guys, you know what works better now, if not better than ever, is a good old-fashioned handwritten note. Um, they're rare. They get a 99.2% open rate. So almost hundred percent of the time they're open. If they're appreciated, you know, the mailboxes are empty and it's just a great like a sales tool. It's a great marketing tool, you know? Um, and that's like where the idea started, but I can, I can dive into this and talk about like the cataclysmic entrepreneurial seizure, you know, enlightenment moment. But, um, that was where the idea started. It was, you know, kind of chasing, looking, going into my MBA, um, listening to a lecture and heard something that, you know, forced a light bulb to go off. Mm, wow, that's a, a pretty amazing story. I didn't know that I had the honor of having a professional athlete on the, <laughs> a former professional athlete on the podcast. This is yeah. exciting. So let's uh, rewind a little bit. You mentioned you had some early childhood trauma and um, you use football to really help you get out of um, the, the pain or whatever you were going yeah. through. A lot yeah. of times people have trauma, whether it's loss of a, uh, a parent or divorce or whatever may mm -hmm. be happening to them and they don't really channel it. So as you think back to you as a child, how could you say, or would you say football kind of changed your life? Well, well, my dad passed away. So my dad passed away when I was seven and um, I was really kind of confused and I, it doesn't really resonate with you as a kid when you're that young, you know, it, um, it takes time. And then, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know how to really talk about that in, in depths, but what we did, how we got through that is we stayed busy. Um, my mom put us in sports year round, made sure we were around positive people, um, you know, people that were going to influence us in the right ways. You know, it's really easy, you know, in life, you know, we all see this people go this road or that road. Right. And my mom wanted to make sure we didn't go down like the drugs and the alcohol and all that stuff. And and a really good way to, to prevent people from doing that is monitor their crowd, their friends, and keep them busy. So um, played all the sports. Um, being on a team was really important to me because it was like a family. Like I remember when I was like nine years old. I mean, I was really angry. Um, and uh, it was like probably my fourth or fifth football game of the season. I was like just letting it all out. I mean, hitting people. I got into like a altercation after a play, like pushing battle. And... This was my first experience as a, I would say as a human where I felt like somebody outside my family was my family. Like I got into like a pushing battle with somebody and then my team swarmed around me and got my back. Mm -hmm. And that feeling, I mean, it gives me chills just even thinking about it. Um, knowing that, you know, people outside, <laughs> people, I don't want to, I'm not going to tear up here. I haven't even talked about this in probably 20 years. Um, excuse me. It's okay. Um, I'm sorry. No, it's good. No, this is good. Um, it just felt really good to know that we were somewhere where I felt like I had a family, right? And um, it was a really hard time, you know, to be young and go through that. And to have people get your back and make you feel protected, it was really important. And these are people I would fight with in practice. So it was like really interesting. Like it was like a family. You fight, right? Like families fight. It's just like a normal thing. Like you go through those ups and downs. It's just life. But when it came time to act, right, they got your back. And um, that's extremely powerful. And it's something you don't know unless you've gone through it. And that's why I, I stuck to football so much. It was just so important to me. That's so good. I recently went through a, a situation, I guess, in my life and going through divorce. And the people that showed up for me were those friends, right? So when you talk yeah. about it, it's like the family that you're born into versus the, the family that you have. And yeah. you're right. We Some of the, the friends that showed up for me, we hadn't talked regularly in years, in almost decades. Yeah. But as something was happening, it's like that's when they show up. And then they envelope you in love. And they really yeah. make you feel like, you know, okay, I have a soft place to land. I have someone who is here who is on my team. So um, yeah. I completely understand that. The, the family, the, the friendship, how that camaraderie really helps you. And so as you moved into professional football and you spent a little time there, are there any lessons that, that as a professional athlete that you use today that translate into business? Well, I think 
if anybody, if you're going to be, I think what you learn as an athlete is going to set you up to be successful in life. If you know how to take those skills and transfer it, a lot of athletes struggle to transfer into the real world. Because when you're an athlete, especially in the college and professional level, your life is dictated for you. You have coaches, trainers, agents, um, you know, everybody, you know, is helping you. Your parents, like you're, you're the nucleus and everybody's like revolving around you to make sure you're successful. They're trying to like have you hyper focus on what you're good at, which is like, you know, your position, your talent, right? And when you get into the real world, it's really hard to now all those people kind of go away and you have to think for yourself. You have to plan your own schedule. You have to plan your own, you know, strategy, right? Like we had interns that would break down game film and like build like the game plan for us. Like now in real life, like you have to build your own game plan, right? You have to learn how to break it down, strategize, execute, learn from your mistakes. And I think that's a lot of, a lot of reasons, a lot of athletes struggles because you just don't have all that help. But if you learn how to tran take those skills and transfer it, you're, you're, you're literally primed to be, you know, in the top 1% of successful people in the world, because you've already developed toughness, competitiveness, you know, uh, self-starter, you know, you know, how to work on a team, how to compete, like all these things that it takes to be successful in life, belief in yourself, right? You have to have confidence to compete at a high level. And a lot of these like simple skills that you think are just obvious, a lot of people lack because, you know, they've been in their comfort zone. They don't like being coached. They don't like being criticized. Like <laughs> I would have like the best game like ever in college. My coaches would like say something like, oh, that was great. But then they would just break you down. Like, like that was a great game. But you walk out of the meetings like, I don't feel like I had a good game, you know, but yeah. like I had 10 years of that, you know, and um, now in the real world, like, you know, I, I would not have, I would not be a successful entrepreneur if I didn't have my athletic background because just the, what it takes that first five years, it is, is I would say this is a hundred times harder than being an athlete. Um, I've done this with no loans, no debt, no investors. I have an athletic and sales background. I've started a software and robotics industrial automation company. And the only reason I've been successful is my competitive drive, the no quit dog in me. Like I'm going to fight mm -hmm. until I die. Um, I'm going to overcome a challenge. I'm going to figure it out. Like, that's just like what made me successful as an athlete. And I've been able to kind of bring it over here. So I think if you play sports, you're very lucky, um, especially if you took it serious, um, like even working out, like the workouts we went through for 10 years, like you literally felt like you wanted to die every single day. Like the, the two hours, three hours you're lifting and running, like they were so hard, but it built your character, it built your toughness, your physical toughness, your mental toughness. Like you're just, you're so you're so, I wouldn't say groomed to be successful, but like, you're just, you're preparing yourself for success. If you know how to take what you've learned and bring it to the real world. That's so good. I mean, that was like yeah. a whole masterclass. Uh, the <laughs> thing that happens and it's, yes, it happens a lot for professional athletes. It happens for college athletes and it happens just for people in college that are going into the real world. They don't have that higher level thinking. They don't know how mm -hmm. to problem solve. They don't know how to really do the things that need to be done. And one of the key things that I heard you say, it's the discipline. It's the mm -hmm. showing up every day and doing the thing, whether it's hard, whether it sucks, whether you like it, whether you don't, and then being coachable. Because oh. if you are not coachable, you will continue to do the wrong thing the wrong way and never get any different results. And yeah. even if you're doing the right thing, you can tweak it. Like you said, you get out the field, it's like, this is my best game. But let's, how do we strive to be 1% better? And I tell yeah. everyone around me, I said, my goal is to be 1% better every single day. How can I get 1% better today? And that is my yeah. goal. And somewhere in my life, I want to get better. I want to grow. And it permeates off of you. And so as you yeah. were talking about stepping into this world of uh, business ownership, doing something that is completely out of your realm, you attract that those kind of people around you, they see the things that you're doing and putting into the world. And so those are the kind of people that are attracted to you. So it helps accelerate your growth even more. Yeah. And I, I, I do agree with you. I mean, we have a great team at our company. Um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, well, I managed a small team at my last corporate job, but it was like three people, but being here, you know, at our current business, you know, we have no turnover. Literally we have, we've never had somebody quit our job and, um, I think, you know, from my story that I was telling you early on from when I was like nine years old, when I started playing football, I literally fiercely protect 
my team and they know that and they feel that I may lack in some other leadership um, capabilities, but they know the person that they're working with or for has their back. And no matter what they need, you know, if somebody, if they feel like, you know, I just fiercely get their back. And some people always say like the customer's right. Like I'll always like, you know, politically correctly deal with the customer, but I will always, you know, protect our, our, our um, employees and they appreciate that. And we may have lost some clients sometimes because there are, and we all know this, there are some very disrespectful clients, like, like people who, yeah, I mean, you give them the world and they're never happy. Right. Um, but I will always fiercely protect our team and they feel that. Um, so it helps them kind of feel like that family vibe that I was getting, you know, 20, whatever years ago. And it works, you know, but like I said, I'm not perfect whatsoever, but for me to build a strong team, like your team has to know that you literally have their back no matter what. And when they feel that, like they'll fight for you as well. And that's going to help your business grow and be successful. How did you go about building that culture? It's not easy to say that you have 0% turnover. Like there has never been a person that has ever left your company or been asked to leave. How did you build that culture? Well, I mean, we're not a huge company. Um, like our W2 employees are only seven people. Um, I mean, our shortest tenure now is just over 18 months. Our longest tenure is five years. Um, you know, <laughs> there's only one person who's not an athlete. So like I can like vibe mm. with, you know, most of them that are athletes. Um, they get it. They get the competitiveness, like my competitive spirit, my drive, um, my willingness to overcome obstacles. Like we just, you know, we connect, you know, we get it. Um, and then, you know, there's our person who was not an athlete, you know, she's, I've known her for probably five years and, um, she's a mom and there's certain things that she needs and we give her the flexibility, you know, that she needs to be a great mom and that's her number one priority. So it's really understanding their needs, their wants as a leader, sit them down once a year, where are their goals, you know, what can we do to make sure that this is a place that's going to work for you and, whatever they tell you, you have to, like I said earlier, fiercely protect what's important to them. So they have to come in late because they, you know, someone's sick. I get it. I'm a parent, you know, I have a three and a five year old, right. Or they got to leave early because one of their kids is sick at school. Like I get it. Like, no worries. Number one, that's number one. This is number two. Right. And if they feel that you feel it, um, you know, they get it. And, uh, it's just funny, you know, it's like, you know, you see these businesses pinching like a dollar on an hour, you know, for like employees. And it's like, really, are you really willing to make them resent you because you're not willing to give them a dollar more an hour or give them an extra day off? Like these people are there, you know, to help you grow a business, right? So you got to make sure that you get their back on what they need you to do. Yeah, it's the human. That is a thing that so many business owners and leaders, they forget it's, Yes, you are leading, you are running a business, you have goals, you have actions, you have things that you have to do, but you are dealing with human beings. And how do you address the needs of the human beings? It's really by understanding who they are at their core and the things that are really important to them. So when you understand what's important to me and I understand what's important to you, then we speak the same language. And if yeah. we speak the same language, then we are striving towards the same goals. We are doing the same things. Just before I got on this podcast recording, I was going through, I was looking at some financials and I asked an employee to cancel a subscription to something that we had. And she, she was like, I've been trying, I don't know which card is this. I don't know. There were a bunch of things that came up yeah. and I found it resolved. It, and I said, okay, I found it. I figured it out. She's like, oh my gosh, I feel so bad. I feel so bad. And all this stuff and all this stuff. She was like, deduct from my paycheck, all of these things. Right. Because that is how people have been cultured. They've been in the corporations they've been in companies and they think that i make a mistake and i need to be punished i said it's okay i forgive yeah. you it was yeah. a small amount let's just move on and we yeah. learn from this here are the corrective actions and keep going yeah absolutely there's a great um i mean we're all learning on the fly right especially these young business owners um i'm always looking for books you know and there's a great book it's called traction like it's about leadership and getting your your business back on track Something we started doing about I don't know, six months ago is we started holding like a weekly get together meeting once a week to get it, make sure we're all on the same page. Cause I think, you know, just like human, you know, whatever it is like the human experience, right? If you don't feel like you're 
together or connected, like it's really easy to start wandering off. So that weekly meeting for us, you know, we're talking about, you know, what's going on in the business issues in our, our operation. They there's, they're in, um, what do you call it? They, we want them to bring ideas to us. Right. So if they have ideas, like we celebrate their ideas, right. And they're getting that praise around people. Right. So I think it's really important, um, like that structure to have like a meeting like that every once in a while or every week, um, because it keeps people together. Um, you guys can communicate what's going on. The first four years of me doing this, like it was only me and then one other guy that knew 100%. Like we did everything with our software team, our engineers team, our sales, our operation, like it was me and another guy. And then I was just like, why aren't we communicating this to everybody? So we're all on the same page. But um, I think that's a really important to kind of build that family environment. Like we all know what's going on. We all have a, a, a say, we all have an opportunity. We all have responsibilities, right? So that's a really important too, especially when your teams are smaller. You know, I would, maybe that'd be harder when your teams are like over 30 people or 50 people, but your startups, it's incredibly important, you know, to keep that nucleus together because it's that nucleus that's going to help you set the foundation for future growth. Absolutely. I 100% agree. The nucleus of the organization and as the leader, you are the nucleus. And so the nucleus doesn't mean that you are the head and you are the yeah. end and the beginning and you have to know everything. It means that you are what keeps everyone together and it is your responsibility to, to spread that out throughout the organization. So yeah. you have this really amazing company where you are doing handwritten um, notes, if you will. And I am mm -hmm. very much a note writer. And when, when I first started in sales, like literally I call myself a baby sales rep. I went to Hobby Lobby and I bought a whole bunch of blank note cards and that was actually a part of my sales process. Like I would literally send those out mm -hmm. and you're right. People were like, oh my goodness, you send me a handwritten note in the mail? And I mean, this was like 15 years ago and they still loved it. And so tell me, how did you, I know where you got the idea and you had that earth shedding, like, oh my gosh, but what was the process? Cause you're not an engineer. You weren't a marketer. Like these are none of the things that were li literally under your belt. So walk us through how that came to be. So again, this goes back to like my athletic drive and experience, my competitiveness. Um, like it took me 15 years to make it to the NFL. So like having overnight gratification was nothing like not new to me, right? Like it takes time for like the best things in your life to work out. And I, I want, if anybody is listening to this, like <laughs> it takes 10 years to become an overnight success. Mm. I am like literally so, it is, I like, it is so frustrating watching all these gurus, right? They just started a business, right? And now they're doing all these videos on how to be successful. And it's like, are you really successful? Or these people who weren't successful, you know, then they start all these coaching things like, well, why are you trying to teach people like when you couldn't get your business off the ground? And there's there's always something to take from somebody. Right. Like it doesn't matter if you started and failed. You know, we can still collaborate and learn from each other. But there's just so much bad information out there. Um, t like take your time. You grow through what you go through. It takes 10 years to become an overnight success. Um, stay in your lane, you know. Don't try to catch the big wave. You know, you're gonna spend, think about you're on a, a surfboard, right? And you're out there and you're trying to swim and catch every wave. You're gonna get exhausted, right? Like you gotta plan, you gotta prepare, uh, you prep, right? And you gotta wait, you know, make sure when that big wave comes. So when you're working on your business for two, three, four, five years, when that wave comes, you're ready to, to get it and write it and, and, and write it out, right? But it's these people that sit there constantly and like, ooh, new idea or new mentor or get quit, you know, a hundred thousand dollars in revenue in two months, right? Like take a little bit of information for that, but don't feel bad. I just, I feel bad for the people who think like they, they can't do it because somebody else is telling them how easy it is. It's not easy. It takes time. But my, my journey is, you know, it's, it's a cool story, but it's not an exciting one. It's taken five years. Um, you know, I, this idea started in business school in 2017. I tested it. You know, I got a really bad pen plotter from China with no paper feed, no technology. I mean, it was really bad. And I sent out 500 like fake handwritten notes, you know, robotic handwritten notes that literally looked like a robot wrote them. But these doctors would call me and say like, hey, Rick, like, like thanks for sending me this handwritten note. Um, like, let's book a lunch and talk about this. And I carried like a $50,000 a month quota at the time. And I sold $280,000 in new business in like six weeks. So like my whole entire company was going nuts. And that's like when the entrepreneurial seizure moment, like 
incredible mind numb, body numb, you know, adrenaline moment happened when, when I saw it work. But um, we started with a pen plotter. I thought I was going to be able to make that work. Um, it's just not a good quality product. It doesn't scale. Um, it doesn't have native software. It doesn't have a native handwriting engine. It's not a purposely built handwriting robot. And I always had the mindset, like, I wanted to sell this business, you know, in the future and to, few, and to truly differentiate yourself because there's a, there's a few other companies doing what we're doing, but they're using these pen plotters and it's slow production times. They look like robots. They, they don't have their own handwriting engine, which is like, it controls how it writes. We use machine learning. So like we don't write fonts, they write fonts. We use machine learning. So the robot knows how it does it, but it was just literally a slow process. We started on uh, the pen plotters. Um, we would lose bigger clients, um, <laughs> because they didn't look good. So it took me, we went through an eight month program with the university of Arizona engineering school, um, to kind of build out like a, a blueprint for what we wanted. Um, and how I found them was just going to networking events. And I ended up meeting like a professor at a networking event and I told him about my idea and he's like, Hey, you need to join this program. Like they'll help you bring your idea to life. And after eight months, like it, we barely like if it was a hundred step journey, we got like one step down the path. <laughs> like it just wasn't good at all. Like, mm. <laughs> it, was, it was incredibly expensive and we wasted basically a year. And then after that, I was like, okay, like I know we can do this, like, but we need professional help. So I literally just got on Google and started like looking up like mechanical engineers in Phoenix, you know, and then I would, would go and meet with a mechanical engineer and I would bring this blueprint that these college students and engineering program built and said, Hey, here's my idea. Like, come see what we do. And then we'd invite them over to our warehouse. They'd see what we do. We'd ask them to quote it. We meet with them and we did that 14 times. I went, they call it phase zero. Um, so again, this is lifting up every rock, right? Testing, asking questions, taking your time, uh, making sure when you, you know, make a decision, it's the right decision. But yeah, we went through that process 14 times. It took us about another year um, of literally asking questions. And we finally felt comfortable with somebody. We would just, lit, this is all we did. We would literally take this engineering company's proposal, just remove all the pricing because you don't want to like reveal the pricing. And then we'd give it to another engineering company. It's like, hey, we got this quote. This is what we're trying to do. Can you guys do it? And then they would quote it. And then we'd go back and keep doing it. Basically like play everybody's ideas against each other until we formed this really cool product. Mm -hmm. And then we kicked it off. And it took us about two and a half years. We spent about $900,000 of customer funded. We're not, we have no loans, no debt, no investors. And this is another thing for anybody listening to this. You don't need money to start a business. I bought these pen plotters for like 300 bucks. And then, um, I got a $10,000, 0% interest credit card from chase. So like I started this with no money and we've always been positive. We've never been in debt and, uh, we've grown slow over time to mitigate risk. So, um, if you, you know, you want to go fast, you go alone, right? But if you want to go far, you got to go together. And that's why we brought in these teams, right? We manage our budget, right? And that's why we are where we're at today. Um, we've built our own handwriting robot. We have 400,000 users on our platform every single month. Um, we have six pending patents. Like I never ever thought I'd ever build a patent, you know? But like, like I said, you grow through what you go through. Just keep putting yourself outside your comfort zone. Do not take the easy route. Um, there's no growth there. Like you're just repeating what somebody else has done. Um, and you're gonna get all that fulfillment. You know, I, I feel extremely fulfilled from this journey so far because I've already taken this so much further than I ever thought I would go. My last, my last like part of this, I want to sell it, but we're not ready to sell. Like, you know, to sell a business is hard. You literally, it's a whole, I mean, it takes years to prep your business for being sold. Like you have to basically make it a business in the box. They call it kill the king, right? I got to remove myself from the business Completely. systems, processes. <laughs> like it's, yeah. Yeah. So it's like maybe in a few years, but, um, that's my last like big goal, um, to sell, to sell this business someday. Wow. So I know you said it wasn't like a, a fancy story, but when you, so I'm going to go back to the beginning of what you shared. There are a gazillion people out here on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, choose your platform that are talking about buy this course, do this thing, invest in this, do this, and you'll get this many uh, thousands of dollars or this many new clients in X number of time. But unless they have lived the life, I like to say, have you lived this life? 
I go check out your background and I see that you worked in sales for two years and then you decided you're going to start a business like that. You don't have enough ante. You know what I mean? Like you yeah. haven't lived the life. You haven't had enough experience <laughs> to be teaching people and then yeah. people are investing so much money and then they get disenfranchised by people who actually understand. So that's one thing, right? It's like, this is hard. Yeah. This is a hard journey. And as you said, it's like, I went networking. That's how, what I started in my business. And that was way before COVID. I would tell people, I was at three to four networking events every single week. And that's literally what I built my business on. Literally going yeah. out there and, and meeting people and talking to people. And this person introduced you to that person and that person. So getting out of your comfort zone. Don't sit in your office all the time. Get out of your house. Go meet yeah. people. Go talk to people. And then take risks. Like yep. some people say, take calculator risk. You don't know it's calculated until you do it because sometimes yeah. it just flops. Yeah. And you said you had a whole belly flop. You invested eight months into something that never it panned out a little <laughs> bit, right? It was step one, <laughs> step yeah, one, of a, step one of, a, of a very long journey. But yeah, uh, I could not agree with you more. It's just taking action. Um, my first manager always used to, used to say this, it was activity breeds results so at the end of the day a blind scroll will eventually find a net right you just got to keep trying keep looking keep asking put yourself out there and your your journey is going to evolve but going back to these gurus um you know i have a i would i would have called him a mentor because i looked up to his business he runs like a 200 million dollar a year business and he just like started becoming like a influencer like now like on social media and it's like, I know his behind the business. Like, I know what he does. Like, I've done work for him. And he always talks about and preaches this. And it's, again, take things with a grain of salt. You know, some people do exactly the opposite of what they're saying they're doing. But, you know, he's trying to mentor a bunch of, you know, entrepreneurs in his space. And he's like, charge more, charge your client more, pay your pay your client or pay your team more. But in reality, what he's doing, and I, I literally see what he's doing, like, He's using like offshore labor, the cheapest possible, you know, for his stuff. Um, I was a, I am a vendor for him. And like, he's probably one of the guys who pays like the tightest margin. He asked for the biggest discounts. So it's like, he's saying one thing online, right? And he just started doing this, you know, but then behind the scenes, he's doing the exact opposite. Like, and there, there could be a million reasons why he's doing that. You know, he may be trying to influence his competition to price high so he can always come under low you know i i don't know but like take everything for a grain of salt you can listen to it dissect it think about it but don't believe like any anybody's story 100 percent because it may not work for you also this guy you know he you know pay attention to you know the people you're following like do you have a family? Do you have a wife or a husband that you cherish and you want to be around? Do you have kids, right? Some of these entrepreneurs like are on their third third marriage, you know, or all they do, like their life is their job. You'll never be able to compete with that. You never will. Yeah. Like maybe if you're lucky, like you never will. Like they work seven days a week. You work maybe four days a week, right? So mm. you got to make sure like the advice you're taking fits your journey. Like it fits your, you know, your path. Like and it's it's just really frustrating because like a lot of these people are lying. They're fake. Like it's but take you know they sometimes you know they, they they have little points like you can take and learn from. But don't feel discouraged because somebody's like spitting something on social media for attention. Like like I think that's one of the big things I've learned too as like an athlete. There's always a bunch of haters like people talking crap. So I've learned like how to put up blinders and like well whatever get away from me you know. Yeah. So it's like I've been able to be able to censor you know, all this bad advice. So I would, I would per, try to protect myself, develop thick skin. Don't feel bad. You know, like my journey's not happening. They made it look easy. Like <laughs> it's not easy. It's, it's not. not. And it's what, not. you know, how you, how you, you know, how it comes is how it goes. If you make it easy, like it's going to go easy. Like I'd rather build a business on a solid foundation over 10 years because I feel like that business is going to take years to degrade and come down versus a quick win will be a quick loss, right? Yeah. So how you win business is how you lose business, right? So if you sell on price, you're going to lose on price. If you sell on relationship, you're going to lose on relationship. You know, you're going to sell on a great product, you're going to lose on a great product. I'd rather sell on a great relationship and a great product because that means someone else is going to have to outwork me on a relationship and outwork me on a product. Yeah. Wow. That, that right there is, I mean, that's golden. That again, I think we've had like three or four masterclasses. 
within this <laughs> podcast episode. And it's what I tell all of my guests. It's like people want the real story. I don't like to come on here. And if people are putting on airs and saying all of these things, and that's why I take it back. Um, yeah. A lot of people don't do that. It's like, oh, let's pull back this curtain. Where did you start and how did you get to where you are? And literally the things that you experience in your childhood, we don't realize that our seven, our eight, our nine-year-old selves, that literally determines who we are and who we will become. And so I look at my son, he is currently nine years old. And I'm like, these things that you're doing, the way that you perceive the world, the way that you're treating people, the struggles that you're going through, like this will impact how you show up. He would yeah. had his cousins here this past weekend and his cousin was like, oh, you're spitting on me when you're talking to me. It's like, I can't control the way I talk. It's just the way I talk. So I had to pull him to the side and I said, son, when somebody says you do something to offend them, you don't immediately defend it. You apologize first. You say, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. I didn't know I was doing that. And then you take it back and you say, next time I'll try to not do that. But mm-hmm. how many 40 and 50 year olds do we know that do that? It's because mm-hmm. nobody, when they were at that age, nobody redirected them. And so everything that your mom put into you, the amazing man that she poured into you and she helped you become is showing up today in the way that you lead your organization, the way that you have so much tenacity, so much drive, you value family. These are all such fantastically amazing things. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I do. I know we kind of had like a moment earlier, but I do contribute this to athletics. Um, football absolutely changed my life. Um, and it doesn't have to be football for somebody. It just takes something, right? It can be art. It can be gymnastics. It just takes a good situation with good people. Um, <laughs> I mean, my coaches when I was a little kid, they were, I mean, they were tough. I mean, they, they, they called it like, if you were going to cry, go to the crying tree. Like they built toughness into us. Like, it was really funny, but I, I do. Athletics has just been such a cornerstone of my life, and um, I, yeah, it's, it's a, I'm very fortunate for it. That is fantastic. Rick, this has been a fantastic conversation. You have definitely enriched me, and I know you will enrich every single person that listens to this episode. What is the one best way that people can get in contact with you? Well, I'm on LinkedIn basically all day, so um, it's just Rick Elmore, E L M. O R E. I usually get back to people within one or two hours. I'm just usually on meetings throughout the day. Um, but I am on that like morning, noon, and night. <laughs> and then if anybody's interested in learning about what we do, it's just simply noted.com. And we uh, will send free samples. You know, you can see robots writing. It's a really cool technology. Um, and we have a lot of videos online about it. So if you're interested, just go to simply noted.com. Awesome. Well, Rick, thank you again for sharing your time, your talent, and your expertise with us today. This has been, as I said, an amazing conversation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. (laughs) Thanks for having me. And that was another episode of the Transform Sales Podcast. Remember, in all that you do, every day, transform your sales. Until next time.